Um, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, be introducing uh, Jim Groom, our uh, speaker today. Um, if you've seen Jim, which maybe some of you have, you've probably seen him in, in uh, things like this. Um, some of the work that Jim has been doing has recently been recognized as one of the Chronicles uh, 12 Tech Innovators, which is funny because it's um, you know, I always make fun of the content that everybody's on the front page. Um, and, uh, and he's known uh, really for two things. Uh, he's known first uh, several years back for this idea of EduPunk. The idea of EduPunk was to really start forming our own solutions, try to tie together multiple uh, free technologies um, or open source technologies uh, to create um, in a um, learning environment for our students uh, versus the sort of packaged LMS approach. And he's known more recently uh, for his work uh, in uh, MOOCs. And you guys uh, indicated yesterday that a lot of you have heard of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Um, and they came into prominence uh, because of uh, some work that uh, some people at Stanford did and some press releases. Uh, um, and I, I guess the project is rolling now uh, from uh, Harvard and, and MIT. But MOOCs actually originate, um, originate really with a guy named uh, David Wiley, a guy named Alec Koros. Uh, David Wiley at, um, at the time uh, at a Utah uh, public university. Uh, Alec Koros at the time, uh, still at a uh, Canadian uh, university. Through some other people like um, that's my uh, chime. This is where we're supposed to start. Okay. So I'll back up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got 15 seconds ahead of schedule. Um, Alan Koros, and then uh, through uh, a person named uh, Stephen Downs, uh, George Siemens, and uh, a guy named Dave Cormier. And then I think finally, uh, uh, Jim, who, who ran. Um, an experiment called DS106, which was really an extension of stuff he's been doing in, in other spaces. And he'll talk a lot about that today. So I don't really want to talk too much about that in the introduction at the risk of, of repeating Jim. I think you'll see a lot of his work in the past, a lot, a lot uh, of, his, of his present uh, present work. But what I want to do is sort of set the stage for what Jim is going to show you, how I think it relates to what we are, uh, what, we're, what we're discussing here, how it relates to our mission, as uh, public uh, universities. And um, to do that, I want to go back in time here to when I first met you. And what's interesting about the web is we have a rough date about five years ago where Jim comes and comments on a blog of mine. It's not, I don't think it's the first one. I think it's the first comment was about the big Lebowski, but you know, that's um, But what we were discussing at the time, there was a, a relatively small group of people discussing the LMS and how the LMS inhibited really learning. And the reason why is the LMS tended to put up walls between students and the outside world, right? And so it tended to make this, not insurmountable <coughs> barrier, but this barrier that really discouraged the class from interacting with the outside world, an outside audience. And uh, so this was a sort of discussion space that it happened in. It was, it was really a community uh, that was kind of informed, I think, by the communities of practice uh, research and thinking about how that played into education. And of course, we were younger, um, lighter, slightly better looking, and, and better at ranting. So, uh, so here, here we're, I'm ranting and Jim is trying to outrant me, um, which, he, which he always, always did. Uh, but you know, what, what Jim says here is really Really, really important. And that, that bit of Jim hasn't changed. If you can't, if you can't read it, it says, uh, this is not a technical revolution at all. It's a conceptual shift, right? It's a conceptual shift. You know, it is about the technology. It's about how the technology is helping us think about this stuff. The technology is forcing us to think in a certain way. It is about the technology. But the bigger story here is the conceptual shift. And what is that conceptual shift? Well, I think at this time, we thought that conceptual shift, I think at this time the community that, that, that we were in thought the conceptual shift was towards this idea of communities of practice, right? Uh, so the idea was that institutions in some ways were becoming less relevant, groups like classes were becoming less relevant, 
because you have all these outside connections to the world, right? So, and those connections tend to provide more value than the person sitting next to you. You can connect to anybody on the internet, right? You put your work out there, get it commented on by anybody. You can get a reaction from anybody. And that tends to erode the importance of the class, right? And I think that's the way people conceptualize it. I think that's still, if you read the coverage of some of these, these newer developments in, in the MOOC space and, and things like that, I think that's still how people are covering this, that, that the internet, you know, Jim is up there under disruptive technology, and the idea is the internet is eroding the importance of everything that our institutions do in replacing it with value that we get from the network, right? So as the network grows in importance, the institutions wane in importance. Your class wanes in importance. You're there to facilitate really the connection to the outside world. Um, but that's not the direction that Jim went, and that's why I think it's really important as we enter into this period of experimentation to, to think very carefully about what we want technology to do uh, and what technology does well. And the direction that Jim took in all the subsequent work, and which I think really comes to a head in DS106, is this, that the network does not erode the group experience, the class experience, the institutional identity. Right? It doesn't replace it. Right? It doesn't even supplement it. Right? It strengthens it. It's in that process of bringing your class into contact with the outside world that you build an incredibly strong, incredibly vibrant class identity. It's stronger than what you could have achieved if you didn't actually introduce them to the outside world. And in building that class identity, you get a passion and a meaning uh, in that class that would have been impossible to get in that class without that exposure to the outside world. And that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about things than I think what we tend to read in the press, which says <laughs> your class is becoming less and less important. Your students have to pay less and less attention to you. There are other things out there that your students can do. A lot of what Jim is going to show is going to look to you like, oh, this isn't something I could possibly do. This is, this is too far out there. Or, you know, this is about digital storytelling. Maybe it's trivial. He's dealing with wallcat stuff, right? You know? I mean, a lot of it may look like that. But that fundamental idea of looking, what is, the, what is the way in which that outside community of the internet can bring um, an insanely strong sense of meaning into your class? That fundamental idea, I think, is something that anybody here can use, no matter what you're doing. And so I, I hope, I hope as, as, as Jim talks, that you'll be wonderfully impressed by the scale of some of the things Jim has accomplished, but you'll also understand that, that there are multiple ways, there are multiple ways of doing this. And as long as you keep in that, as long as you key into those central ideas, this is all stuff that you can, all stuff that you can use, even the animated uh, gifs. So uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll introduce Jim and uh, take it away, Jim. about that is that's probably the most important part of my presentation you just heard. <laughs> I, I can never like articulate anything that clearly. I just jump around, I get excited, and I hope there's some sort of point you take out of it. I'm not a very theoretical thinker. I tried to be. I went to grad school during the whole post-structuralist era. I have an idea of who Derrida is, right? I'm into that stuff. But when I sit down and do my work, I can't really think that way. I really think through examples, and I think through relationships, and I think through people. So what I'll be talking about for the next hour or so is some of the work, not only I've seen other people do, and some really amazing work, but some of the work I've been a part of at the University of Mary Washington. And Mike's point is an important point. I'm, I'm public for life. I went to uh, community college in California. Well, actually, I, I have a kind of crazy, I went to uh, public school in Virginia, then community college in California, then uh, the UC system, and then back to CUNY, and then I spent a week and a half at the University of Richmond, and it was so rich and private that I ran away, I didn't know what to do. I was, I was so like, I was like, I've only been public. So I've actually um, been part of a public system, and I really believed in the system CUNY in particular, because CUNY was trying, its mission in the 60s and even back to the 30s, was the idea of open education for anyone. You don't need to afford it. There is no admission system. And the idea is that anyone who could and was willing to come to us, we would try and educate. 
And I think that's an amazing vision. And I don't know if the web can meet that vision entirely. But there's this unbelievable platform by which we can start thinking about that <coughs> as a public institution, wherever you are. And that, to me, is exciting. So I'm going to step back for a second and get into my presentation. Um, I'm now still thinking about my comments, so I can't even focus on my own presentation. I hope that was it. Um, so I'm pretty bad with titles. A, a quick kind of pun, rich media. What's a poor public school to do? The poor is important to me, though. Poor matters, um, because being at CUNY, or being at the University of Mary Washington, or being part of public institutions, a lot of our, in a lot of our issues are money, our finances. And so Mary Washington, which in Virginia, there's more money than there ever was <coughs> in CUNY. We had to do a lot with a little. That was our challenge. And what I really love about what Mary Washington did is, rather than investing in technology or huge systems, they invested in a group of people. So I actually am a representative of a whole group of people from the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies that have been working together for the last seven or eight years to build some of the stuff I'm about to show you. So this is not also a solitary act. This is an act that comes out of a community that's been building together. And this idea of not only rich media, but poor schools, I think, you know, when you invest in people, you're far richer than you've ever imagined. And that's one of the hard things people have been able to get around. And Let's talk about that in relationship to toll roads. All right, um, I'm going to start with a video. Right? Always start with a video. Right? Blazing sap. So we're going to make sure, you know, like, what the hell does this have to do with it? It's not the what, you know, why, why world of sports going on? That's not what this is. Um, let's, yeah, let's take a look at this and let's talk about why it's relevant. One of the ways in which the university and ed tech has approached the web, ironically, whether through LMSs or these major systems, is kind of like this scene in Blazing Saddles. Let's take a look at the scene and I'll talk about what I mean. Did you hear that? Can I turn off the light? Yeah. Turn off the light. The Pedaman Grunway. Now, what a lot of ass on the front door, Rex. Has anybody got to die? <laughs> Somebody's got to go back and get a shit load of dirt. <laughs> All right. Immediately, and then we come back here. I mean, you did it just in time. That's probably better for you. Um, immediately, what do you think of? You got this web. You got this unbelievable space. You can come in it from a million different places. In every university, around the nation, if not around the world, wants to come through it through one space, and they want to pay a ton of money. Not realizing that the entire web is open. The entire approach to teaching and learning is how we imagine it. Yet, like lemmings, like these folks in the desert, they all want to go through the one toll booth and pay money. Why? I don't understand. So, one of the things I'm interested in is alternatives, cheap alternatives, sometimes free, although free I don't think exists. Yeah. Free is actually what you pay people to do, but you're not paying corporations. And I don't have a problem with corporations and learning. I just seem to feel better when they're not around the work I'm doing. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of the issue. So I actually want to talk about a project that I'm really interested in. And actually, we had had a conversation about this over dinner last night. So I want to talk a little bit about that. But this is a this is a ed tech kind of course program that happened at the University of British Columbia by John Beasley Murray. He's a Spanish professor. He's te he teaches Spanish literature. And this was the idea. The idea was pretty simple. I'm going to have a course. It's going to be a face-to-face -face course, brick and mortar course at the University of British, British Columbia. And there's like 12 articles on Wikipedia that deal with a number of novels and authors that we're reading that are terrible that aren't developed, that have no research, that just haven't been built out. And so his idea was, and this kind of gets to Mike's point about content versus interaction versus assessment yesterday, his point was, there's no content on there on the web that's good for them, at least through Wikipedia, and my students are going to spend time in a brick and mortar library doing real research on these novels, and they're going to bring these articles up to snuff. What's more, he put an assessment part of it. 
he's basically said, if you get an excellent article, it's an A. A good article, it's a B, etc. And what do you mean, who decides that? Well, the Wikipedia community decides what's excellent and what's good. So he actually really offloaded the whole assessment to this community. Now, if you know the Wikipedia community, that could be very dangerous, right? <laughs> so we'll take a look at that in a second. So his name of his class was Murder, uh, Madness, Murder, Mayhem. And here's an example of one of the articles. This is actually um, a uh, Nobel Prize winning writer from Guatemala who wrote this El Señor Presidente, which is kind of a radical book talking about dictators in um, Latin America. And this article was terrible to begin. In the course of 15 weeks, this article, and you can see the gold star here, became a featured article. It was on the front page of Wikipedia. And it had everything to do with weeks of research and sharing out of that research of these students. Now the question, and this kind of point gets to Mike's interaction point yesterday, <coughs> is how do students do this? How do they get on Wikipedia and how they build it? Well, there's a couple of things here that are huge. They have to learn how the Wikipedia community works. They have to learn to interact with crazy trolls and some people would say Wikipedia Nazis, right? They have to learn to navigate this whole space. They have to learn how citations work. Because one of the things you can say about Wikipedia that I love, and there's been all this kind of you know, questions about Wikipedia, any Wikipedia article citation needed, which to me completely grabs on to the scholarly process. So these students had to get in there and learn. Now the professor went in a semester before and he learned how the process works so we could take it through them. But something happened. And I was worried about this picture because Mike Caulfield's pop culture references died yesterday. I just want to say, does everyone know who the A-team is? Yeah? You know the whole gold chains? Okay. Big fan of the A-team. This actually group emerged on Wikipedia. They called themselves the F-18. The Featured Article Team. There are a bunch of maybe grad students, right? I don't know, homeless people. I don't know who they are. <laughs> I mean, but they're impressive. They came and they met these students in the articles and they said basically, we know you want to get this article featured. We've seen your project. How can we help you? And so you had this whole army of people helping these students get this article, these articles featured. I mean, when else does this happen in your class? How much is the technology to run Wikipedia for you? What are you and your students going to pay? Nothing. How about extra support, tutoring, peer support? Nothing. And what you have is this unbelievable resource. Now watch. After 15 weeks, the F-18, and this is there, I have a whole article, I'm not making this up. I'll share my slides with you. This is the article, this is to the featured article team. It's a group of people that are identified, they think of themselves as the A-team, they come into articles, they clean them up, and then they leave. <laughs> but you know how that narrative grabs onto it? It's kind of wild. So this is the F-A team. And what happened at the end of this semester is, and this is a really interesting stat, I want to show you this so I can show you the next slide. There are 3,580 featured articles on Wikipedia out of a potential 4 million. So that's what? My math's not very good, maybe 1%? Is that right? I know you do a lot of stats. <laughs> it's not a big number, depending on that. Of, the, of this class's 12 articles, <clears throat> three of them were featured, eight of them were good, and one group just fell apart. <laughs> it happens in every class, right? We know it. <laughs> but what does this say? about a process whereby, and then think about what this is doing for the public domain of knowledge. They're doing all this research in a brick and mortar library that needs to be done, and they're bringing it back to a space where on average a month will have 60 to 100,000 views by people all over the world. And these links aren't necessarily the end of the research, obviously. They're the next step. And so, I'm really interested in an idea, this is a completely free process. It takes you as a professor learning how Wikipedia works, learning how the social construction of knowledge happens, understanding how these debates upon what's true and what's not, understanding how to cite in this space, that's what it would take. And what's interesting to me is any of us could do this in this room. We could learn this community. And it would be no overhead financially. It would be a lot of overhead in terms of dealing with, if you're going to try and do a very popular article, you'd have to deal with a lot of crap. 
Because there is, and people, we've talked about this last night, Wikipedia is becoming more and more procedural. More and pe more people are getting a little bit crazy about the ideas, um, whether they're true or not. And the idea that John Udell brought up last night, which is a fascinating one, that I think people should consider, is, is Wikipedia openly hostile to expertise? But if it is, what does that mean for what we do? It's a fascinating question. It's not what I have to answer. But we can really only wrangle with this in this space. Because whether we admit it or not, and I won't ask a show of hands because I know you're going to lie to me, we all use Wikipedia. We all use it regularly. It's an unbelievable resource. And it's an unbelievable community about the construction of knowledge. I talked about post-structuralist theory earlier, right? Not in any intelligent way, just that I've heard of it. But the idea is post-structuralist theory is wild in our moment because it's happening. Right? The social construction of knowledge is happening right before our eyes. We don't have to read Christopher or Derrida to understand that. But what they saw is what we live now. And our students have the ability to be a part of that in some really powerful way. So here's my first example of a possible project in dealing with rich media that you might want to think about. Now, I'm probably here. I mean, the whole idea of me being written up in the, in the Chronicle is kind of a joke. Um, and I'll tell you, how is it a joke? Um, they came to me and they said, look, the first thing they were doing for the call of innovators, you know, is they said, put the innovators in the comments on our blog. So if you go, there's like a thousand comments. And if you go through that comment, no one ever put my name in. No one was like, oh, Jim Groom's a great tech innovator. No. What they did is they had this open class of this guy, Andrew, Andrew Andrea Sanier, I think his name is. It's a Pearson project where they're doing open class. You've probably heard of it. They had that, the corporate model for the LMS, and they wanted me as the kind of token anti-LMS edgy punk. That was very basically why I'm there. This edgy punk thing, which has been kind of my cloud following me for the last five years, <laughs> has gotten me all these opportunities. Now, at the end, I tried to do the right thing, talk about DS106. But at the end, they weren't listening to it. They were honest with me. They're like, we're not going to do that story. We're going to do the story that we've decided. So I was like, OK, that's fine. Everybody at my school will love it. I might get a raise. You know, I'm not against that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to fight that. But, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm a great tech and I'm going to listen. Because what happens here happens because a community of people come together and imagine. It has nothing to do with me. Yeah. I'm just a patsy, to quote a the article. Okay. But one of the things that's amazing that I've been a part of and I've watched grow and I'm really proud of, and it's five years old, this summer is this thing we created called You and Libby Blogs. And it's an educational publishing platform. And over the course of five years, we've probably had close to 500 classes run through here. And it's really been an amazing thing to watch people working on a space together to build knowledge. Not unlike Wikipedia, most of the sites, if not all of the sites on You and Libby Blogs default to open. Which means anything a class creates on this space is openly available. People can find it. And it's using the same application you guys are using for this website, uh, for this conference, WordPress. Um, we're a WordPress school. Our main site is actually on WordPress, and I'll talk about what that means for us now. But what has this site afforded us in terms of rich media is kind of mind boggling. Um, here's an interesting site. I'm going to talk about this for a second. I'm actually going to go to the site. So I'm going to get out of my presentation. This is a site by um, biology professor Stephen Dow. And it's a site he came had the idea with over Christmas break that he wanted to do it by January. And I love this guy because he gets all excited. He's like, I just need, I don't need anything. I just need to do it. Set up the site. What it is is they have these, these have these microscopes in the biology lab. And these are actually pictures of particular cell tissue that students took through a microscope. They took it with their digital cameras. And then they uploaded it directly from the camera to a WordPress blog. And what's amazing is there was nine students in this lab, and there's over 700 images of various tissue. And you can see it. Not only did they take the picture and put it up, but they started to narrate their process of how and what this kidney renal cortex is and means. So you got this visual space, and you also got this narrative space, and this all took place at their lab. So what you have online is a collection of 700 images and descriptions of various tissue. 
that students were doing. And that is starting to get searched and found by other people. I find this remarkable, right? And I, this is one example of many. Of, let me just go back down here. And I'm going to go through a couple. Well, actually, I can jump right here. Here's another site by Professor Mark Scanlon, who's in the English department. Probably have some English professors here. Probably have some biology professors here. Um, this seems like a run-of-the-mill site, right? You got your, this is how we do a lot of our WordPress blogs. You got your home, you have your assignments, reading schedules, reviewers. Mara Scanlon is an amazing teacher. And she does what I think is some of the most amazing things with these blogs. And what I like about them is it's completely unorthodox. Not only is the site, like her classes are kind of like concerts. There's t-shirts at the end of the course. Everyone's like rocking out like they love each other. Like she feels community like no one else I've ever seen. It's really amazing. I go to her classes because I want to learn how she does it. But something is interesting. Like here's the post, the text to the post, right? Three lines. Here are the tags for the post. It's like five lines. What's going on here? There's this subtextual relationship amongst these 30 students through tags that is absolutely the most fascinating thing I've seen on you with blogs. Stop like, Andy Leonard and Kane Cassidy are lovely, sexy, and studly young men. <laughs> Helen Alston is not so bad either. That's a separate tag. <laughs> Priapus and his blushing bride, Will Thompson, I have no idea what that means. Robert Frost, 13 ways of looking at Andy Leonard naked. <laughs> what the hell is going on with these tags? <laughs> and if you look at the tag cloud here, you'll see <laughs> that they start to have these conversations. And what's fascinating is it's not just a conversation limited to this class. She has students who take several classes. So these tag conversations happen between and among students at different blocks. And what's happening is the tags and the understanding of the poetry and of the relationship of people to that poetry builds itself into the class. So the tags are not at all useful to anyone else who's outside of this community. But what these tags do, rather than filter information and you know, folksonomically understand the web and categorize it, no, it doesn't do any of that. It creates community. And it creates a sense of joy. And it creates a sense of connection. And to me, having worked with tags for so long and using them as this RSS syndicated space that you will use, and everyone's like, I don't care about that. I want to know if Andy Leonard is naked or not. That's what we all really want to know. And that's fascinating that this is how it works. Now, it's not limited to that, though. We have a bunch. Literary journals, and I'm not going to get into the presentation because I can jump right out. Talk about rich media and talk about what's possible. Over the last, now it's almost five years, um, as soon as you and the blog started, we had students creating literary journals on WordPress for a class. It's a literary journals class. We have almost 40 literary journals that students have created. The kind of inaugural issue. Now, one of the things that happened, and this happens a lot at UNW blogs, and I'll talk about it, is they do things that they don't even know they're doing that are radical. And this is what I'm fascinated by. For example, there's a whole genre of literature called e-literature, or interactive literature, right? And there's a, there's a, a writer, Aaron Reed, who's at Santa Cruz, I believe, who wrote this interactive fiction called Blue Lacuna. I don't know if anyone knows it. It's kind of genre-breaking of its kind. Well, as a journal, no, there's no kind of interactive fiction journal. And so these students not only interviewed him, but they actually embedded his interactive fiction into their blog. So if I go here, what you'll start to see is not only that, but there's actually, let me go to the, here's the beginning, right? What is happening, Parchment is loading. What the students did is from the actual site, you can go through the interactive fiction. And you would think, OK, good, they embedded it. We helped them embed it or something. This was huge in the interactive fiction world. They were all linking to this blog. Finally, someone found a way to embed our fiction in their journal so it can be featured. And these students kind of felt important. They had figured out a simple thing about how to embed interactive fiction into a blog as a kind of journal feature. No one else had. And they were actually the talk of the interactive fiction community, which granted is not as big as like the animated GIF community or the <laughs> rainbows community, right? But it was important. And this journal, for many, was groundbreaking. This is a student. <coughs> it's amazing to me. 
Another thing that happened this semester, and this is amazing, and this is something that we might build a course off of, is we have a civil rights leader at Mary Washington who taught during the 80s, James Farmer. James Farmer was kind of, uh, he's a great historical figure. He came up with um, Martin Luther King. He started the sit-ins in the South. He won the debate versus Harvard, that small college Wiley in Texas that could. I mean, he's this figure. He's, a, he's an iconic figure of the 20th century. Many people think overshadowed by Martin Luther King because there could only be one. But anyway, this amazing figure, he taught at Mary Washington. He would give these amazing lectures. He would sit in front of the class and he would talk about his experience as a civil rights leader. Talk about being hiding in basements from the police, from the KKK. I mean, compelling stuff. We have 13 of those video lectures from the 80s. So what these students did is they took transcripts of all of them, they put them up, and it's now the site stands as a resource for an entire class given by James Farmer at UMW. Open and available to anyone. And these students built it. It was there. It was in our archive. But now it's open on the web for anyone to see. And you can see, you can see the full lectures, you can see the transcripts, stories people had about him and his time here. It would be very interesting to have a civil rights historian come in and teach a class based around another class. Like the teaching a class of a class, kind of like the meta class, right? It would be fascinating. And I think for many it would be interesting. Now, if that's not enough, and this is this kind of idea that happens, and you know what, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, the examples go quick, and they are many. We talk about the idea of community-based learning. And we don't actually do, we don't have any like mindful practice where we community-based learn. Like UMW, we have the town and gown problem. We're separated from our town. There's tension there. And right? the town wants to make sure there's no more than four students in a house. That's their biggest concern. There's four students in a house, it's a brothel, and you're out. It's a weird kind of insane law. What happened back in 2009 is a group of students came together through a history class taught by Jeff McClurkin, and they built a site that featured all the historical markers around Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, and Stafford, which are the three counties surrounding Fredericksburg, where UMW is. And one of the things that is, is, you know, history is huge in Virginia, right? They still have that kind of battle between the Puritan started America and Virginia started America, and that's gone away. Virginia's a very pissed. That everyone thinks that, you know, it started at Plymouth Rock. I'm sorry, the Plymouth State people, right? But, like, there's that real tension. You're like, oh, right. So, this is interesting. And there's historical markers everywhere. There's historical markers like, Jackson's leg was amputated here. I, like, I can't even show my kids these historical markers. They're like, what does amputated leg mean? Who's Jackson? Right? Um, I'm now known as Stonewall Broom. It's really weird. I mean, that's how they understand people. Quick story before I go on. So 2005, December 13th. Does anyone know significantly December 13th in the Civil War? Fredericksburg, anyone know what happened? There was a huge battle. The first battle. There's two Fredericksburg battles. One where the South cleaned up on the North. That's the one everyone talks about. Because the second one when the North came in and finally beat up the South. So what happened on December 13th was Huge battle, the Irish Brigade came up the hill that I actually live on now and was slaughtered. I mean slaughtered. Like 7,000 troops died on December 13th. So me and my wife, unbeknownst to us, come in 2005, December 13th, move into Fredericksburg on Marie's Heights, where the slaughtering happened. My wife's from Italy. We just came from Brooklyn. We were like, okay, I'm going to finish my dissertation here. This is going to be a great little kind of hamlet for me to get away. And all of a sudden, Walking up the street, we see Union soldiers. <laughs> Walking down the street, we see Confederates. And all we see, and about five minutes later, she's looking at me, I'm looking at her, and I'm like, I don't know. And then we go into our U-Haul, and then we see the Union soldiers running down the street. Run away! It's a massacre! Like, what the hell? She's like, I want to get out of this place. I want to get into. And like, that's it. Fredericksburg, the Civil War, is a current event. It's happening, right? It never got away. And the bottom line is, you know, it is important to many people there. Usually when you've lost that part of history, Faulkner talks about this all the time, it becomes that much more valuable. And what I'm fascinated about this site 
is this is a site where people started to find these historical markers, and the students did awesome research about particular primary texts that link to this, so secondary uh, texts that link to this. And the community started to say, hey, they're actually doing something useful at UMW. They're building sites that actually we can use again. And this is a site by our stats monitor that gets anywhere from 10 to 20,000 views a month. And that's not unique. We have many class sites of student created research that get thousands of views every month. Which to me is kind of remarkable. And I think it lets students think about the work they do differently. A quick note on this this is an exhibit created by students about Venice. And this site is our highest traffic site, I don't know why, on UMW. It gets 50,000 views a month. And I think that's pretty remarkable. Now, I talked about, okay, here we go. No test view, it's a little break. I want you to Google the term band art. Don't look at the images. I can't be responsible. If you click on the image search, I will not be able responsible if you see a band before. That's you who have to live with that. Stay on the web. But just Google the term band art. Oh my god. Wow. Me, oh, that's right. What's the first link? Yeah. We own Google. <laughs> we have thousands and thousands of bloggers. We have maybe anywhere from 50 to 100,000 posts a year. And those internal connections and links promote the work our faculty and staff do, particularly our students. They get found on Google. They emerge through that infrastructure based upon this, what we're doing with UMW blogs. And it's really interesting that, you know, classes now are starting to kind of show up in the first 10, 10, 10 results from Google. I'm excited by that idea. So, there's the, that's the actual course blog. It's a great course blog called by Nina Michalewski, dealing with band art of all kinds. This is my final example from a publishing platform. Then I'll move on to the second part of my talk, or the third, actually. And this happens a lot. And it's really, for me, this is why I love it. This is why UMA Blogs is still near and dear to my heart. And this is why what we do as instructional technologists matters. This is a writer. He writes short stories and novels. He has a blog. Fascinating um, writer. And he published, whose name I'm forgetting, um, who, he published a story on the website nerve.com, and a group of students at Mary Washington were reading the story for a class on disability literature. So this particular um, story has to deal with disability. And what happened was, he must have been doing a vanity Google search or something. And what he found was a student at UMW's blog post about it. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting, I just want to read a little bit from this, probably bad practice, but for me, it's fascinating. I'm not famous, God knows I'm not a genius, but what's made me is the story seems to find a life being. So he talks about this story, and it's a life of its own. And what happens is, here, anyway, a student named Amanda Grace Gorman in the English 375A2 Disability and Literature class at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia, wrote a paper about my story. I copied it and pasted it below. I read it yesterday and burst into tears. Assessment, the writer of the story I wrote a paper on burst into tears. That could be good or it could be bad. I've been writing now for 25 years or so. And I've had reviews in the New York Times, Village Voice, Boston Globe, Publishers Weekly, and players from famous writers and editors who say my stuff is great, etc., which is good for him. But this was the first time I cried reading something somebody wrote about my fiction. This wouldn't have happened without you and my blogs. Without that student and these faculty working together to build something, to share something. And that's it. The technology is a mechanism for stuff like this. It's real, it's powerful, I can't make it up. I really don't know how to supplant it with the next new great thing. This right here, when students do that in our courses, like Mike said to introduce this, it changes the dynamic of the class changes the dynamic of what we do together. It inspires us to be better at what we do and to share more. And this is not an isolated event at Mary Washington anymore. It happens often. Now, if I go back to my presentation, and I'm being very, um, well, there it is. I'm starting to figure out Firefox. 
So for the open publishing piece here, what we're trying to do and what we've been doing is we're developing an open source publishing platform and we're happy that WordPress is open. We didn't come to it to say this is an OER project. We want to share everything and here's our licenses. We just did it. We just defaulted to open and hope people used it and they did. But ultimately what's happening is it's being integrated into our general curriculum. Students are doing this stuff and creating community, hybrid, online, offline, you name it, as part of a larger community effort to think creatively with and through the web. That's what's happening. You know, and it's powerful, and it doesn't have to be dogmatic or ideological. You know, it can just be a practice that we cultivate in our classroom and need to. Now, there's other side effects. We have 600. 800, I think close to 1,000 posts of students all around the world posting their experience. How many of you have study abroad students that go places? Right? Many of you. We have them, we aggregate them, they log wherever they want. This is an amazing resource. Students love it. And we didn't even have to tell them to do it. They're already using the blog at UMW Blogs to write home. So it's funny, most of their posts are to their mom and dad. Like, hey, really great time in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, you wouldn't believe the fish. And then pictures and stuff. And then they start realizing, like, I'll go on and comment. And then they start realizing, oh, wait, this is public. People are actually reading this. And it changes their tone in interesting ways, but it also allows them to share their work here. So much so that the university has finally caught on and said, you know, what's feature this stuff? And they are. I mean, it's cold. We have students anywhere from China. We actually had a student in Africa during the Civil War who is blogging her experience. That's, that's experiential learning. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's awesome. And with the web, we can capture it. This is another little experiment we did. And I don't know how many of you, you at your universities have problems with this. One of our biggest problems is understanding what's happening around campus, right? Who's doing what? Who's presenting where? Who's sharing what? What's happening where? We created a simple thing called Eagle Eye, which the idea was distribute the publishing. Anyone who's done a presentation or featured on a TV show or write a, wrote a paper or a book can come in and <coughs> write their own professional note. Anything that's happening around UMW, write it. Any event that's happening, put it in a Google Calendar and we'll aggregate it. What happened in really interesting ways is that this is the most authoritative site that's distributedly published by our university. And in two years, it has over 2,500 posts, which I think averages out to something like four or five posts a day. That is awesome. I mean, that is awesome for our community. That is awesome for an archive of who we are. That is awesome for a professor or a student or a staff member who wants to come work. They understand what this culture is like. And this, once again, was done by people, not by a mandate. Now, I talk about this Google Calendar thing, and it's one of the really, it's a shame. I did this experiment back in 2008 or 9. I don't remember when. Does anyone remember when Google Calendars were open? They were publicly available to anyone, right? You could actually, it was kind of creepy. People didn't know it was open, and you could kind of search. It's like, oh, that's what John's going to be doing for lunch, right? Like, you can find their public calendar. And when people started to think it was creepy, I think Google said, okay, we're going to get rid of the whole public calendar, which was a shame. Because when I did this search for UMW and Google's public calendars, I found 45 public UMW calendars. And these calendars, when I aggregated them together, was the most up-to-date and official actual record of what was happening around UMW's campus. It was amazing. I guess Google got scared because people didn't know that their calendar was open or not, so they closed that. So you can't publicly search calendars anymore. But when you could, it was amazing. But this idea actually is born out of a larger idea that we've played with at Mary Washington and we've been inspired by Keen's own John Udell. John Udell came to us in 2006 and he was saying and talking about what we did. From then on, he went on and he did this thing called the Elm City Project. The Elm City Project and the piece about this project that for us has been sustaining and driving our work for the last six years is the idea that why can't you let people do their work where they do it? Whether it be the library, whether it be a student's own Google Calendar, and have them share a space 
and aggregates. So all the different businesses in Keen share what they're doing through something as simple as an RSS feed, if it's for posts, an iCal feed, if it's for events. And then you have, just by the distributed nature of people managing their own work, the most complete calendar, series of blog posts, etc. And that's what we've been doing on the OW blog since 2006 or 7. We've been aggregating work from various student spaces into a blog called the Mother Blog. <laughs> and now, what is what we have to jump this? That, and it's a conceptual jump. It's not a technical jump, although there's some technicality to it. Is how do we allow people to understand that when they syndicate out, they don't have to do anything more. They do their work where they do it, and through the very simple idea of sharing a feed, whether it's an iCal feed or an RSS feed, it comes to a public aggregated space that everyone could use. Now, I talk about this with events. Think about this with work happening around your campus. The best work your students are doing, the best work your faculty are doing, all in their own spaces, aggregated in one space, so everyone could see. It's what we're doing with the study abroad blogs. It's what we've been doing with the calendars in Eagle Eye. It's what we've been doing with hundreds of classes. And the idea is, can you make it simple? Can you make it work so that everyone owns their own space but aggregates it back? Well, that's the next piece of this talk. And apologies to Virginia Woolf. I took her idea of a room of one's own, mm -hmm. um, and I kind of morphed it a bit. That's not as good as Virginia Woolf, obviously. But Virginia Woolf had this book, A Room of One's Own. And the book basically said, <clears throat> to have your own space, to be independent, is a way for you to be liberated, and for women, in this example, to write. To write free of the kind of social, economic, and political demands. I mean, it was kind of way a form, and she framed it as a form of liberty, so that you know, this idea of men being dominant writers is purely an idea of the social constructions around us. And so you can liberate yourself through that. And I was kind of what Mike had referred to early on. We at Mary Washington have been fascinated with this idea of students having a space of their own. So often we put them into Blackboard, or we put them into some system, right? And we say, do you work here? It's a wonderful place. And then after six or 15 weeks, what do we do to their work? Deleted, right? I want to do that whole, like, uh, delorded. You know that one? Who wears the mask? Strong man. Strong man. Delorded. Right? We just delete it. It's like, that says, I don't love you. <laughs> Giving them a space that they can manage, control, and own, and take with them over the course of their career is the opposite message. And so what we've been playing with, and I was once again talking about this with Mike and John last night, because I don't know if it's going to be successful, but it's something that I feel like UMW Blogs has been building to for five years, is the idea that every student who comes into Mary Washington has their own domain, and potentially, if they want it, their own web host. And what they do with that space is they do and share the work they've been doing over four years out with anyone. And when that time is over at Mary Washington, they take it with them. It solves the e-portfolio problem, because we really don't know what an e-portfolio is. Is it institutional assessment? Is it departmental assessment? Is it individual assessment? Is it just a term to sell a piece of software? Yes. I mean, it is purely kind of ridiculous. So I'm like, well, I'm not like, many people are like, why not think about this in different ways? And we've been running this kind of domain of one's own kind of silently for about three years, four years. And here's a really good example. Let me go to Caitlin's work. Here's a really good example of what this could mean for a student at Mary Washington. Caitlin Murphy, she was a history professor, and she actually was one of the people who was pioneering our new digital studies minor, which doesn't exist. It's a, special study, it's a special major right now, but she was here. She's a photographer, a videographer. She created this space over the course of her four years at Mary Washington. This is her domain. Notice the domain, CaitlinMurphy.com. Notice the WordPress there. She mapped it onto WordPress.com. She's like, I don't want to host it. I don't want to worry about that. I want to own it. I want it to be mine. I want it to be my resume and a record of what I've done at Mary Washington, my professional work. But I don't have to worry about being a society. And this is kind of really interesting that we have 500 students now, we're a 5,000 student uh, university who are doing stuff like this. We're opening, managing, and controlling the work they do. And it's not an isolated event. 
And through the beauty of syndication in RSS, the work they do for various classes can be brought right back in to their site and taken with them. I mean, this for us is the model. But the same thing John Udell has been going through with Emil City is the challenge we're going to have with UMW Blogs. How do we allow this to conceptually work for people? Because when you start mentioning syndication, aggregation, and RSS, people are like, they glaze over. Mm -hmm. The eyes glaze once and that is death, death and possible to fame, to quote Emily Dickinson. She was from around here, right? That's what happens. You say RSS and people are like, ooh. <laughs> no, WYSIWYG. Like, that's what they want to know. Google Form, something easy. And so we're still fighting that conceptual barrier, but I don't think it's over. I think that battle is still being fought. RSS is not dead yet. Don't listen anyway. It's like that whole Monty Python. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm not dead yet. All right, another example. We have tons of examples. This is a student aggregated work. She blogs for 20 courses at Mary Washington. She aggregated it all back in. It's a beautiful site. She manages her own Blue List account. She's actually into it. She actually works as instructional technologist now in Turkey. <laughs> another example portfolio. And then it's not just students. We have faculty doing it. Um, faculty, this is a, an author who uses this when he's on TV or whatever. He features his own stuff. You know, it's kind of his space to share the work he's doing. Now, I want you to, that would be, this is the third part of my talk. And think about it like this. You go from Wikipedia to open, chaotic, wild west publishing. I think it's interesting. I'm going to try it this fall. Next, you have the blogs, this community, right? Kind of tight knit community. For us, it's worked and it's worked very well. Domain of one's own is a kind of, it's a riff on that community. Now I'm going to move into the revolution that for many people is ongoing for me thoughtful. And I got to apologize. John Adams is in this clip, but I'm focusing on what Jefferson said to get that whole <laughs> north south. Why were we going? So Jefferson was really the idea guy. No, I'm kidding. You guys really don't care about this. Right? <laughs> what is he going on about the revolution? We don't care. We didn't watch the Adams series. So this is a great clip from the HBO series, uh, John Adams. And this is Thomas Jefferson talking about a concept and a theory that he actually talked about extensively in his writing, and we'll talk about it in a second. But here it is. Expect that any constitutional document that emerges from Philadelphia will be as compromised as our Declaration of Independence. I am increasingly persuaded that the earth belongs exclusively to the living, and that one generation has no more right to bind another to its laws and judgments than one independent nation has the right to command another. <laughs> so what is he saying? What is Jefferson saying here? Jefferson has this whole theory that he actually, in the notes on the state of Virginia, and a lot of his letters to John Adams, actually articulates quite better than here. It's nice that the kind of show framed it, but his idea of the eternal revolution. His idea of the revolution at the revolutionary period was, it shouldn't stop now. Like, oh great, we've got a free democratic country, let's lock it in, right? <laughs> no, he's like, every generation should be revolting against the prior one. It should be an ongoing, eternal revolution of ideas, of democracy, of this vision. And this is kind of how I think Mary Washington and DTLT has particularly approached how it approaches or attack. We don't want to be happy, we got new MW blogs, we got this, the revolution is one for. No. We believe that this is a constant space needs to be, because there's so much external, ex so many external attempts to colonize this market. We see it everywhere. Coursera, Udacity. You know, like I said, not that that's bad. But as Mike mentioned yesterday, a lot of the innovation that's happening, you would never know it from the press, is happening at public schools like Keene. And why are we standing still to allow all this work we've been doing and creative stuff you've been doing in your classrooms get packaged up and sold back to you as a product? And more than that, a product that says what you do is useless. What you do is replaceable and expendable. I mean, that's the most vicious kind of product. So what we've been experimenting with is the idea of MOOCs. And this is uh, my session, my little discussion of this thing called DS-106. 
And we don't think of MOOCs. When you talk about MOOCs, let me go to my next slide because this will kind of introduce them a little bit. <coughs> MOOCs, it's an unfortunate term, right? <laughs> MOOC. Has anyone seen uh, Do the Right Thing? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Mookie, right? Yeah. All I can think of is do the right thing. And Mookie being like, Sal, where's my two fitting, right? And then the whole racial explosion that happens after that. I mean, MOOC is an unfortunate term. But what it stands for is massive open online course. And that's basically what it means. And the years I've been playing with these, I've always had questions around the, the M, the notion of massive. Like, what does that mean? The web is massive. You can have a thousand students in a course. And that would not be maybe considered massive, you start thinking about the other courses, but you think about how that fractally builds out to other people, and that could be massive in the ways that the web is massive, in the distributed web. But the idea of massive as we understand it now is always about sheer numbers, right? And you'll see this, and as Mike already gave a great introduction, so I won't repeat them, but this is one of the early MOOCs by Stephen Downs and Joyce Seaman. The MOOCs many of you probably heard of is this one by Sebastian Thrum, right? the artificial intelligence, which had over 100,000 students. Which, I have to say, is pretty amazing. If you think about how would you manage a learning experience for 100,000 people? How many TAs would you need, right? <laughs> I mean, it's really, they don't worry about that. They're just robo-grading, right? And their idea is, you know, 100,000 people sign up. Maybe 25,000 people actually go through the class. Maybe 5,000 people really do well. That's still a ton of people. We have 5,000 people at Mary Washington. That's a lot. You know, that's not insignificant. But the idea of massive here is surely the number, right? The idea that you could run X amount of thousand people through a course. And I don't think it really, at least in terms of interaction and what I've seen with Udacity and Coursera so far, I don't think it really deals with the question of interaction or of assessment. I think Mike talked about beautifully. How do we deal with that? So DS-106 never pretended to be massive. I mean, I don't think it is a massive course. It gets discussed with other massive courses, which, you know, like with the Chronicle article, I'm not going to say no. You know, you want to throw me in all these papers and do all this stuff? I mean, I'll make the record straight. It's not massive in that way. I think it's massive in different ways, and I'll talk about that. But DS-106 took this idea of the demand of one's own and took some ideas by Gardner Campbell who used to work with us at DTLT back in 2006, 2007. And we kind of ran with it. The idea of the course from the beginning was get every student, they come in, they get their own domain, their own web hosting. They set up their own blog, and they manage it. They become sysadmins of their own education. And this idea is basically out of Gardner Campbell's article, The Personal Cyber Infrastructure. And I'll give you a quick, try not to read too much, a little bit though. So how might colleges and universities shape curricula to support and inspire the imaginations that students need? Here's one idea. Suppose that when students matriculate, they are assigned their own web servers, not one gigabyte folders in the institution's web space, but honest to goodness virtualized web servers of the kind available for $7.99 a month. And why would you do this? Why is this significant? Why might this be important? I think part of what we're doing as public institutions and institutions in general should be helping students understand what's happening on the web. How all this information that they're using and filtering for your classes is being created, is being understood, is being indexed, is being searched. This is an important form of literacy right now. Some people call it computational thinking, some people call it web thinking, but this is stuff we want our students to be exposed to. And we have hard, real data that when they are and they learn this stuff, they do far better on the job market. We have data. People who take the S-106 write back to us regularly that they got a job because they understood WordPress. Sounds very pragmatic, but it's a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? We all like our jobs, right? Now, what the S-106 is at its core is a networked experience. I started teaching this class in 2010. It was not considered a MOOC, but it was open and online. I've always taught my classes that I've been teaching since 2005 open and online. I've had a website, everything I do is available to anyone, people want to play along, they can. Something changed in the five years between when I started teaching these classes online and when DS-106 blew up. And part of that is my networking prowess over that five years. Over that five years, I was, hey, I'm on Twitter, I see a moose. I, you know, I don't see this in Virginia. I see a possum. That might be better. 
I say raccoon. You know, people are like, that's the stupidest thing. You're wasting your time. <laughs> Twitter is the stupidest thing. You're right. Five years later, though, DS106 would have never happened without that network. Without a group of people that I've constantly interacted with on my blog, on Twitter, and other spaces over the years. And what happened, and why DS106 took off to the degree it did, is because I was part of a network relationship with hundreds, potentially thousands of other people. And the thousands doesn't matter as much. In my mind, it only takes a few people, like Alan Levine, right, who was there with me, who was following the work I do, and started doing it himself. Between the two of us, we can become a kind of army of blog and twitting and just having fun with what we're doing and using a simple hashtag called DS106. Other people saw it, they enjoyed it, and they jumped on. Now, that's the actual online portion of the class. The face-to-face -face version, and I taught this class in several different ways, had 25 students in it. And they were doing the course with me as their instructor. The online part didn't kill them like ants. It didn't go away. It wasn't any less relevant. In fact, the online students reinforced that student's work. They created the community Mike had talked about. They commented on their blogs. They talked about how awesome their video was. They said what you can do with Photoshop that they didn't understand. They helped me give feedback and teach the course. They helped the students understand that when you do something like this out in the open, possibility is everywhere. And it was really, to me, amazing. And one of the things that happened that I really find is truly amazing is we built this space called DS106 Assignments. Now, when I first taught the class, I had an ego problem. Some people would say I still do. I don't agree with them. But I had this ego problem. I thought my 10 assignments were the best assignments in the world. How could you, you puny little freshman, tell me that your assignment is better than mine? Well, turns out, most of their assignments were better. And it took the push to try and make this class a MOOC to realize that. What Martha Burtis, when we actually, I brought a bunch of people in and we planned what might DS106 look like if we kind of intentionally invited people and they didn't know the class. And what we came up with is this idea that we would allow people to submit assignments and do them. So what we did is with a Google form, with the RSS feed pulling back into the WordPress blog, is we created a space where people could submit assignments. My students in the class, we had a whole bunch of people see design and visual assignments. My students in the class started doing it. And I was like, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm still very skeptical. And then one student, Colleen Tracy, I'll never forget her, she's awesome. She's like, I submitted an assignment. It's called the Windows Media of all things, not the iTunes, but the Windows Media poem, playlist. What was this? You take a series of songs from your playlist on iTunes and Windows Media, and you make a poem out of it. Right? All the song titles, you make a poem. Right? Like, uh, help. And then you think of any other songs? Like, I can't even think of a song. Like, help. Uh. <laughs> anyway, they put in song names, right? And I was like, that's a stupid assignment. I was, I was like, I was like getting into how arrogant thing. Like, no one's going to do that. She submitted it on like Thursday. Tuesday, class meets Tuesday, Thursday. The next Tuesday, she came back into class. 60 people from all over the world had done her assignment. And she was obviously dancing on my little grave of arrogance, but at the same time, she was inspired by the idea that the work she had done not only had touched people in her class, but it touched people in Australia, in Portugal, in China. And that is a different experience that doesn't erode the classroom, as Mike said so brilliantly, it just reinforces it in ways that I think before the web, it would be very hard for us to imagine. And this assignments thing, for me, is one of the most powerful elements. Now, one of the things we also did with DS106, and this is kind of, I'm talking about the architecture of an open class, what it might look like. That's what kind of we're talking about here. And all this stuff is done with WordPress, and we went from using Google Forms to using a plugin called Gravity, uh, uh, Google, yeah, Google Forms to a plugin called Gravity Forms, which is a premium plugin, I think you have to pay 50 bucks. But that has really streamlined the whole process. Now, what happens if you guys, as a collaboration of institutions, had an assignment repository based and filtered by this? I mean, this is not just about digital storytelling. There's creative assignments to be had in every discipline. I think some of these from digital storytelling would map onto that beautifully. We have this other thing called the Daily Create, 
Once again, program in WordPress, just a series of plugins. We are not programmers. And what happens every day, students in this class have to do a creative assignment. It's about managing the creative habit. Getting in there in the habit of doing something creative every day. And there's a audio one that goes right up to SoundCloud. All they do is upload it to SoundCloud, tag it, and it shows up on our site. Flickr, same thing. YouTube, same thing. What we have is, this is actually a site that people use. And they create things on a regular basis, and they're not just the part of the class. And that chorus idea of being in the class and being a part of it is really powerful. Here's a good example. So one day, you know, I kind of read DS106, you know, psychotically. It's like all I do. My wife is very glad I haven't taught it for a semester because I'm actually getting back into the idea of having a family. Um, three young kids, but you know, sometimes they have to wait. Right? <laughs> but anyway, so this thing comes up. This is a visual, a design assignment called. The four icon challenge. The idea behind it is take a movie, a book, a TV show, and use four icons to describe it, right? And you'll notice there's a spelling error. Happens a lot in DS-106. Um, but one of the things that happens and unique about this is this is what I have designated the drive-by assignment. I have no idea who did it. It's not a student in the class. It's not anyone who's taking DS-106 regularly. And we get these often. People who see one assignment, they want to do it, they tag it right, they pull in their feed, and we see that one. We might see it on Twitter, we might see it in the main blog, but people just do assignments. People just engage in an act of creativity and then leave. And this idea of the drive-by assignment is fascinating to me. Because to me, if you build a structure whereby people can engage quickly, whether it be blog comments, whether it be an assignment like this, you've created the possibility for serendipity, the possibility for something that before, if it's locked in some kind of box, couldn't have happened. And to me, I love this assignment the most because I don't know who did it. But it's not limited to this. Any of you grew up in the 80s like me, like mm -hmm. 70s, you were in like, elementary school? You remember these DC Valentine's? Yeah. Aren't they yeah. awesome? <laughs> Once someone at DS106 found these, a student. It was like, we are a team. DS-106 in 2011 was really like on all cylinders. People were in it. It was an amazing thing to watch. So they created a Valentine for other people in the class. It became an assignment. Create a Valentine, right? One of the things that happened in DS-106 that I just found amazing is people would take assignments and then riff them. So they would find those DC comics, and then rather than having like, we have a time, they have, you look hotter online. So they would actually meme them out. Right? And I was like, when I was teaching this, I was like, look, Superman is saying this to Wonder Woman, and all the women in the class were like, no way, Wonder Woman is saying that to Superman. <laughs> and so like, there was this kind of really fun, playful element to remixing each other's works and then remixing assignments. Until the point where Alan Levine said, let's kind of see if we can play with the structure of this. And he built another part of the class called Remix, which means you can take previously done assignments, they pull into your kind of frame, and then you remix them. And that's an assignment you can build onto the original. And it's that fractal relationship between building that's not about numbers and hugeness. It's about the horizontal nature of the web, the distributed relationship of playing and creating. That DS-106 wants to get at. And I think classes in general can get at. And you know when you have arrived, <laughs> someone mows DS-106 into their lawn in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> That's awesome. So we were like in winter, and I don't know if it was much of a winter, but you know, it's summer in Melbourne, Australia, and Rowan Peter, Peter Rowan, who did this, took a picture of it. And it's just, it's, I mean, that playful element, you can't downplay it. I could talk about a whole, pre a different, I could talk an entire presentation just about this. But, quick version, we didn't want to use Blackboard, we didn't want to use Illuminate, we didn't want to use any of those kind of terrible synchronous systems. To pretend like it's like the fluorescent lighted system, right? Like, Ugh. you don't want to be there. It's like, when are they going to pull out the drill and start going after my molars, right? Um, <laughs> DS 106 was actually just a radio station. It was an internet radio technology that's been around for 10 years. It's nothing unique, it's streaming audio, but we used it to stream out classes. And then people, we created a Dropbox and we linked it to the radio station and we said, hey, upload whatever you want. And so it became a 24-hour radio station of music, of presentations. 
And then we would, people would realize, oh wait, with my iPhone or with my uh, Android, I can actually hack in to the server and broadcast. Think about that for field stuff. Hey, hi, I'm here at uh, Keene State University, you're on the radio. And that's all it would take, and I could break right in. Or you could do it from any of your laptops. Just start broadcasting and doing a show. And so this whole world of radio took over the class in 2011. And it was amazing, and it was retro, right? Grant Potter, who invented the whole thing, figured out a way that you could have a 1-800 number. So that you could go to a pay phone and dial into the radio. And be talk, so we did this in Brooklyn, because they still have pay phones in Brooklyn. And we're like, hey, how's it going, DS-106 radio, from a pay phone. Or you could bang from a pay phone, put it out, and just use it as an environmental microphone. So anything that goes on in New York City past the pay phone would be on the radio. And I just loved it, because this spirit of experimentation was taking over the class. And it was taking over the class, not with the latest new technology, with old gold technology. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was part of the joy of it. We didn't stop the radio. We wanted to control the vertical and the horizontal. Mm -hmm. So then we went to TV. And I have about two minutes. And I'm, I could talk about this for another hour. The TV was amazing, but it didn't really take off in spring because it was too late when we discovered it. It took off in the summer. And we did Minecraft. <clears throat> a whole other story. I felt like I'd go over a drink. Um, Twitter was huge. Cool story. Week three, DS106 radio breaks open. We have a student in the class who's a senior computer science taking this class for fun. He says, hey, you have this great server of radio stuff. What if I create a Twitter bot that picks up every time it plays a new song? And create a Twitter account so every time a new song or something gets live, like here, we can capture it. The student creates a Twitter bot with other people in the class giving him advice, like Al Levine. He writes blogs about his process of creating the Twitter bot. And then if the student isn't good enough, just doing this on for fun, he creates a video game for the final project that's called The Beneath, which is about someone searching for bags of gold to escape the LMS of Blackboard. <laughs> he got an A. What's interesting is when you create an environment like this, where you can't necessarily see the road too far in front of you, you also create the possibility for students, faculty, open online people to experiment wildly. And this student learned something that was useful to him, and he'll take to other jobs, but was also very useful to the community. That Twitter bot is still running, and we've run over 50,000 tweets through DS106 radio. Every song, every play, if the RIAA ever wanted our ass, they would just go to the Twitter bot. They'd say, oh, look, 50,000 songs, which is kind of a point of pride for us. Um, so, quick. What this leads to, I think, and this is the, probably the funnest thing I've ever done, is it leads to this notion by Ray Land called the pedagogy of uncertainty. And, you know, part of what we do when we go into a class, hopefully, is inspire students. Make them maybe a bit confused, make, challenge them on some of their deep concepts, and kind of have fun. And digital storytelling, you know, people say, you know, that's kind of a light, fluffy class. But at part of digital storytelling, for me, is the notion of digital identity. Who you are online. How that reverberates through the eternity that is the web. Fascinated by this idea. So when I taught DS-106 over the summer, it was a five-week completely online class. First time I ever taught online. And I was like, you know how I want to do this? I want to do this like Dr. Oblivion. <laughs> you guys know who Dr. Oblivion is? Dr. Oblivion is from David Cronenberg's film Videodrome. Yeah. You ever see Videodrome? Own it. You own it. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. You know something about Dr. Oblivion? For 27 years, Dr. Oblivion has never come face to face to present. He's only presented through the mediated presence of TV. That's his whole vision. That TV is realer than real life. That's his whole, and it's funny, Cronenberg studied under McLuhan. And it was McLuhan that he based Dr. Oblivion on. And Cronenberg's really a heady guy. So I just love this idea of Dr. Oblivion, but I didn't want to do it through the TV, because the TV's kind of... TV's kind of outdated. So I wanted to treat Dr. Oblivion like it was through the web. So my narrative for the students as they came into the class, and I sent them emails before, is for 27 years I haven't dealt with anyone through anything but the web. It's 
kind of hard because the web is at 27 years old. But they didn't care, right? So I was like, the whole idea, like, I'm Dr. Oblivion. And Jim Groom is my TA. So he'll be contacting you on a regular basis. But I'm the one with the big ideas. So we created this character. I shaved my head. I didn't have that much to shave. It was not like a major. But I shaved my head. First Monday of the class, came down, and my, mom, my wife and kids were like, what's going on? <laughs> my kids for the next five weeks called me Dr. Oblivion. It was really kind of this trippy. By day three, I was so outside of my comfort zone of identity that we decided to change the narrative. I couldn't do it. The lecturing for an hour and a half in front of people, it's just, you would be surprised I couldn't do it, how well I do it now. But I, I just couldn't do it. I was Dr. Oblivion. I was freaked out. <laughs> So, Dr. Oblivion went missing. <laughs> and, and the TA, Jim Groom, took over the class. The problem with that is, the TA, Jim Groom, became power hungry. <laughs> and he started banishing people from the class. He started banishing students. So the students created an alternative class called DS-107. <laughs> and DS-107 was trying to find Dr. Oblivion to bring back what's right to the class. Freedom, independence. And ultimately, it turns out, it kind of jumped the shark, the class, a little bit, week five. It turns out that they all went to an, a, a summer camp called Camp Oblivion, and the students were being killed by Martha Burtis, who was the TA who didn't get the job and who was very angry about that. We didn't realize that she had people knocked in the basement in this cabin. It's a very complicated story. That said, this is actually video art that students created around Dr. Oblivion and around this whole notion of identity. So check this out. I'm going to show you a couple. You can stop me at any time. I'm well over time. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's your assumption. Oh, hold on. Oh, it's just going. Go ahead, it's trying. syntactical order. <laughs> Assignment after that, 
But they were actually creating this stuff. They were creating the narrative as it went. And I'm not suggesting this. Is, this is what you should try in the fall. This is a great idea. Change your identity, which may be unethical. I don't even know. I don't know what you do. But what I want you to think about for a second is that mediated through technology, mediated online, we have only just begun to imagine what's possible. And you start thinking of models like Coursera and Udacity, which have their value, but they can't at all deliver what we deliver through an experience on the ground with students, whether it's mediated online, face to face. I mean, this stuff can only make it that much more amazing. And so rather than suggesting, like, that's only something someone else can do, or that's already being kind of, you know, colonized by these huge markets, I would recommend that this stuff has only, we are still in the infancy of imagining what's possible. And it's stuff like this that I get excited about, because you're going to frame this for the future. It's not going to be Sebastian Thrawn. It's not going to be Udacity. They're too worried about profit. One of the real benefits we have at public institutions is we can worry about imagining. And we can do it somewhat freely still. That's, that's an amazing gift we have, and we should use it. That's it. Hi, uh, Steve Cavello, Rich Media Specialist, Grand State College, um, WordPress evangelist. Um, Big fan of your WordPress. So, well, you know, I did the ATA website and all this. So, you know, I'm right on board with the gravity forms and all this stuff. But one of the most important aspects, as I'm listening to what you're presenting here, are what I might call the cultural ingredients that contribute to the willingness to participate in this kind of an endeavor. And it seems as though there has to be sort of some kind of critical mass that tips this whole kind of thing into something that everybody just sort of joins in and participates with. Um, what were your observations in the emergence of the uh, designs that you just explained that contributed to its success on a cultural level? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And it's a question that, you know, I'll try and answer as honestly as possible, but I do think it comes down to and there's two examples. There's UMW Bloggers, which is the early one in 2007, that we had to get a cultural mass around, and critical mass around. And there's DS-106. And what happened in both examples, I think that's consistent between them, is that we focused on a community that was positive. What people don't realize, and I think it's very simple, is people want to be featured. Their work wants to be featured. So UMW Bloggers, the people who were using it were good professors. They were doing awesome stuff. So we created a simple space on the homepage where we said, look at the awesome stuff these professors are doing with their students. And that got people's attention. Other people wanted to be featured. Other people were proud of the work they were doing. And that created that cultural, that kind of critical mass of culture. And it wasn't vanity, right? I mean, narcissism, you know, it's not always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And the idea of feeding into good work that's happening around campus that no one else is, no administrators, no student, no one's really doing it for our faculty. So we created an unbelievably cool niche where we could say, you know what, the stuff you're doing is awesome. It's not only about publishing. The stuff you're doing in the classroom that's open and available matters. And when we started to take note, I think they got excited. And the same thing happens with students working in the city. When you start to say to other people that your work matters, this is not an exercise. This is not divorced from what you do. This matters. And we did that with the students' work. When they did great stuff, we shared it out on Twitter, I blogged about it, I talked about how great I thought it was, and they said, oh wait, you know what? The stuff I do and how I do it matters. And I really think that was the secret sauce. I mean, I would love to make syndication easier. I would love to make RSS better for what we're trying to do. But I ultimately think at the end of the day, it was featuring and bringing people together around work that no one you know, we're all so caught up with the data and the numbers and all this stuff. We're not thinking about there's a simple process of saying, you know what? You're awesome. And people respond to it. And in turn, you know what they're going to do? They're going to be like, and you're awesome. And you're awesome. 
And then maybe that's backpacking and some people, I'm not a hippie, like I'm not into like, oh, everything's great. But I do think there's been a real dearth of celebration of the stuff we do on the ground. And I think you and the is just a place to celebrate that. DS-106 is a place to celebrate what's happened in the classroom. And it's not trivial. It matters. It has made two huge impacts on two communities. And I'm proud to be a part of both. You know, so I, that would be my advice. Find great faculty, find great students, promote them. And let people know. Eagle Eye is born out of that. It's a promotional tool that, you know, people ultimately, some people feel uncomfortable at first, like, ah, I feel like a self-promoter. I feel kind of, you know, but at some point it's like, no. They start to realize that other people are interested in the work they do, and they're sharing it. It's not vain self-promotion. It's actually how we need to think about the web. You know, and I think those ideas, they're like personal characteristic traits. Characteristical that in the work. But character traits that we have to get over. They have nothing to do with the technology. The WordPress at this point is pretty easy. No, you can write an email. You can just about do anything you need to do in WordPress. That's why we went. And I can't say that was a trivial choice either. That choice made a big difference for us. No, it did. Does that make sense? Yep. So if you want it's come up, it's a, a, we have a multidisciplinary neuroscience program at UNH, and it would be great with WordPress to do what you did, and then that could even go across to Australia. Well, uh, and, and is it that easy to use WordPress, uh, or is it a learning curve, or is it, should I bother my people in IT? I know. Here's what I would say. You could play with WordPress.com, you can see how easy it is. You can talk to other people here, because I'm sure other faculty have used it. Um, I, I've been in it so long, I can say it's dead simple, but that might not mean anything to you, because you've never been in the interface. But I talk to people. I mean, as publishing platforms go, it's very easy. And one of the things, I cut off about 10 minutes of my presentation because I was way too indulgent. But one of the things that DS-106 led to was, like you're saying, interdisciplinary across not only campuses, but I mean uh, the school, but also across campuses. Mm -hmm. So we have people in New York, Japan, um, Portland, uh, Florida, in California and British Columbia all doing their own version of DS-106 that all aggregates into one course. And we just use tags to filter by. So you're thinking about this thing, but if you have other schools that are doing neuroscience, you can bring them into that relationship if you have a relationship with them. Like, I wouldn't even limit it to a campus or interdisciplinary. You could start bringing in people from all over the world. Literally. Well, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, so, and I would talk to other people about WordPress, or if you want, I can sit down and show you what I know about it. Okay. It is yeah. impressively easy. I'm going to have to pull you. Okay. I'm so sorry. Well, thank you very much. Well,